to everyone out in Zoom land. Uh, welcome to our first keynote, Leveraging Autonomous AI to Solve Disparities in Healthcare. Our speaker is Michael Abramoff. Professor Abramoff is the founder and executive chairman of Digital Diagnostics, the autonomous AI diagnostics company, which was the first in any field of medicine to get FDA authorization for an autonomous AI. In primary care, the AI system can instantaneously diagnose di diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema to, at the point of care. He has many achievements. You can see the, the program for the full list, uh, but we are honored to have uh, Professor Abramoff here today discussing uh, AI. Come on up. All right, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much. Very exciting to be here. You see my title slide, I'm from Iowa. I'm proud of two things since we had this discussion this morning, mostly to Zach, that I'm proudly to be a fellow of IEEE. And also there's two roles, you sort of as you age, you see in my hair that I'm not probably the oldest person in this room, but as you age, you accumulate more and more functions. So two things I want to mention. One, I chair part of the collaborative community on ophthalmic imaging, which is an organization put into place by FDA where they want to interact with all stakeholders in healthcare on regulatory issues they're having uh, and, and, a, and a regulatory approach. And the second one, and I chair the foundational principles, which means sort of the ethical framework for all these regulations. So, you know, if you're more interested in being part of it, welcome to join. And then the other one, I also am the chair of what is called the Coalition for Healthcare AI, which is in DC, a lobbying organization that is a collection of pure AI companies in healthcare trying to get policy on payment, especially interacting with Congress. So that may be relevant uh, for any of you who are considering following in these paths. Uh -huh. There we go. So my talk is about disparities in healthcare and how AI can help solve them. And, okay, there we go. Um, and, and so this is a New England Journal uh, article uh, just last year talking about health inequities paying a lot of attention right now to that issue, and I think it's one of the biggest problems we have in healthcare right now. I mean, healthcare is really unequally distributed, so very good healthcare is already there. AI, as you saw, is already there. It's just very unequally distributed. And part of my talk will be how we can we address that, how we can improve that so everyone has access to these you know, wonderful technologies. I want to make one thing clear, and uh, thanks for introducing me with this word autonomous AI, and what I mean by that. You have autonomous AI and assistive AI. Autonomous means that the medical decision is made by the AI, by the computer. It also means the liability, we're discussing this this morning, liability for the AI creator. And there's actually AMA policy on that. Of course, when you have assistive AI, clinician may, still makes the ultimate decision. That also means that the liability remains with the clinician. But autonomous AI has a big advantage that it can be where the physician is not, where the provider is not. And that is very important if you want to improve access, right? In this case, you just need an outlet. You don't need an expensive specialist like me. And that is not the case for assistive AI. You still need a doctor to be there with the patient. And that means, in my view, and I, we're discussing it this morning, that the real world value of autonomous AI is not only improving patient outcomes, but also population outcomes because you improve access. So inequities, one example is diabetes, and it happens to be what we'll be talking about a bit. There's 34 million people with diabetes in the US, you're probably aware of that, but it also means that about 60,000 people every year go blind as a result of diabetes. It's the biggest cause of blindness in the working age population. The sad thing is that this visible loss is almost entirely preventable and highly treatable by someone like me, a retina specialist, if it is caught before there are any symptoms. That, needs, uh, that means you need an eye exam, and these eye exams are not happening. Am I on my mic, or can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so these eye exams are crucial in finding the disease before there are symptoms, and then someone like me can treat it. The problem is that 85% of people with diabetes do not get these eye exams. 85% in the US are not getting them in one way or another. And not only that, but the biggest thing is that there's major health disparities in diabetes. For example, African Americans American, uh, and Native Americans have almost double or more the amount of diabetes, but not only that, they have worse outcomes in terms of complications. They have less care and they're underserved in care, for example, for the diabetic eye exams. So this 85% is actually worse in, for example, blacks. 
So giant source of health disparities. So in my view, and that of many others now, I'm, I'm happy to see, is that autonomous AI can address it. And so that's what this thesis or this hypothesis we're going to look at in this talk. Uh, like the introducer already said, it's FDA de novo approved. It was in fact the first autonomous AI to do so. It means you can make a diagnosis in mere minutes, no human oversight. It's more accurate than me. So what is interesting is you can validate it against some I, I call outcome, and that is different from comparing it to physicians, because if you compare it to clinicians, you can never show that it's better than a clinician. But in this case, you, I can actually, and I'm free to say that it's better, more accurate than a human. It predicts visual outcome if patient not treated, which is important, we'll get to that. It's related to outcome, the AI output is related to outcome. That means you can use it in primary care and retail with a minimally trained operator, and that's why it was so exciting to see what Caption Health is doing with ultrasound. It, you know, access is like one of the biggest problems, especially for AI. And this, of course, a platform, so there's other AIs being developed on the same platform. Fully integrated, we had a cool discussion yesterday. So this is my argument that health AI, and this was made this morning multiple times, shouldn't be created in a silo. This is not the way to, I'm from Iowa, there's a silo for, you know, corn, and, you know, they're all around. <laughs> so I wanted to put a picture of a silo in there, and so that, that, that is a neural network in the silo. And the danger is, of course, that you, you very much focus on the cool technology that you're building rather than on interacting with the healthcare system and integrating it into the healthcare system. That, that doesn't lead to, well, it may lead to rose-colored glasses, but definitely, you know, I may mix my metaphor a bit with the unicorn wearing, forget about it. It's, so there's rose-colored glasses and there's unicorns and rainbows. And so, because there are many concerns, and rightfully so, about healthcare AI, I've said, you know, in, I like this logo, Stop Glamour AI, which means AI that is technologically so cool, and I'm a computer engineer, like I tried to show in the beginning, and I love cool technology, but if it doesn't affect patient outcomes or cost, maybe, um, I don't think we should be at least paying for it, and maybe not even worth doing. But anyway, patients, all stakeholders in the healthcare system have uh, questions like, will it benefit me as a patient? Will it exacerbate rather than improve healthcare disparities? What is actually have going to happen to my data? Is there racial or ethnic bias? There's a whole segment tomorrow, I'm very glad to see that. Who's liable for errors and who pays for all of this? And that this is not, you know, made up concerns. These are real concerns like, you know, uh, Zaid's uh, Obermeyer paper, of course. Very important study to show how AI, including bias in AI, can harm, actually harm patients. So not only that, but there's many stakeholders in healthcare that you need to be aware of if you try to build AI for healthcare. Creators of AI like me, but also patient and patient organizations first. Congress is going to have an ever more uh, heavy vote in this, the GAO, regulators, federal agencies, but even uh, use PSTF as well as PCORI are having, you know, thinking and, and working on AI. Physician and provider organizations like the American Medical Association, specialist organizations like the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and then finally payers like CMS and private payers. They all have their own thoughts about AI and the risks of AI that you need to address. And that it is not an empty threat or fear. The fear of backlash of techlash, I think, is real. There was more talk last year when all these publications about bias started to coming out, but it's still there, and that this is not unfounded, you can see from gene therapy. We were really well on our way with gene therapy getting to patients in the 90s, some unethical experiments happened, young people died, and it was shut down. Funding dried up, institutions closed, and it took until 2017 before we actually had an FDA-approved gene therapy in retina called Luxterna. So that really slowed down the field because of unethical behavior. Another example that you're probably familiar with is Theranos. And even very recently, we saw in telehealth some problems with a company where you know, drugs were inappropriately prescribed. So you have to be careful what you do and you better be sure that you're well-founded in ethics. And I speak from experience. So I was merely doing my science on AI for you know, improving patient outcomes and for lowering costs. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a scientist, and here's this big editorial in the biggest ophthalmology journal in the world, Ophthalmology Times, by the chair of ophthalmology at Hopkins, who's now a good friend, Pete McDonnell, uh, the retinator, like the terminator of the retina, with this picture in it, right? And that's me, okay? And so, revenge of the machines, like AI is going to kill our jobs, it's lowering quality of care, 
do we even want any of this? So it was good. I mean, looking back, it, is, it was good. It, it was not fun at the time. And my chair asked me very painful questions at the time. Why, oh, you know, what's going on here? But we did. And then 10 years later, in the American Medical uh, Association website, look, they did an interview. And they headed it with this ophthalmologist is doing healthcare AI the right way. The point is not that you know, I'm so proud of myself. That's not the point. The point is you can turn this around. You can address it by being open, by being very um, uh, open and accountable for what you're doing with AI. And so that was this choice that we had as a company, this dichotomy, do we disrupt healthcare, do we become the Uber of healthcare, or instead do we work within the system with all stakeholders, you know, not siloed. And so I think it started with an ethical framework and we spent so much time on creating this. It was an entire issue of the American Journal of Bioethics about the, you know, the, 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 the framework we created. There's a picture I will explain later. And it, I think, led to the following things. A, a regulatory framework, and we'll talk more about that in detail, about how do you regulate, how do you prove it's safe, how do you prove it's efficacious, and how does it fit into the clinical workflow. And also a payment framework, and I'm very proud to say that last week I heard that finally this paper is going to be published on a reimbursement framework for AI in healthcare. And that's really important because payers are on the paper, the RUC is on the paper. And you know, I look forward to being able to share it with you. But that led, in my view, to the first ever care, HEDIS and MIPS care gap closure with an autonomous AI in 2019, thanks to NCQA. First ever CPT code for an autonomous AI, thanks to the RUC and the AMA, as well as the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And then finally, as of this year, a very uh, good reimbursement for this specific procedure, autonomous AI being reimbursed at about $55 for Medicare and about $80 for private payers. Ultimately, back to the center, we all do this to improve health disparities, the start of this, this talk. So what I mean with this ethical framework, and you know, I forget McKernan, I think, the paper from 2018 about uh, suicide AI and uh, ethics. Uh, and it's sort of interesting, I wasn't aware of that paper, even though we looked at many papers. Um, but we started with a few ethical principles, and I want to call out the main ones, which is beneficence or non maleficence autonomy of the patient, equity or justice, and then responsibility. We're trying to fit in uh, the, the liability into this. So you can see what we're trying to show here is that these, you, know, you need to find a balance. And primarily, these ethical frameworks are not to tell you what to do. They allow you to measure uh, metrics for ethics, I like to call it. They allow you to measure in how much a specific AI is meeting a specific ethical criterion. And of course you need to find a balance. You can never be 100% guaranteed autonomy for the patient as well as 100% equity. It's just not going to work. So there's this tension in between and every system, every doctor, every provider, every computer scientist, every creator needs to solve that for themselves or otherwise regulators will do it for us. And a little bit more detail is this tension where patient benefit or harm, equity and bias, you know, I'm going from left to right here, and on the bottom row, patient autonomy and responsibility all interact with each other and have influence if you try to meet them on the AI system and then you find an optimum, I call that Pareto optimum. So that's what the framework is for. It allows you to measure and think about these things in a careful manner, but not only that, it allows you to ensure that all these concerns that people have, and there's so many more, you can address. If you don't have a consistent framework, it's just harder to guarantee that you've not thought of some you know, problem that people may have. It helps so much when you use these you know, centuries or uh, millennia old uh, ethical principles. Anyway, it was published, um, won't go into that. And that led to what I mentioned, sort of the regulatory framework. I mean, FDA won't like me to say that but I can say it here, that we work very closely together to use this ethical framework to come to what is called considerations for regulation, meaning what do you think about in terms of, if you want to meet, want to meet certain ethical principles, what do you measure in terms of sensitivity, uh, population adjusted sensitivity, et cetera. I'm not going to go into details, but I will show a few examples. And it's a very exciting group from AI companies, uh, regulators, um, um, clinicians and even patient organizations now. And this is the first paper we're doing many more. And then this other part that also led to important things is this reimbursement framework and I will go into a little bit of detail that's coming out soon. 
So these considerations, I sort of listed them here. I'm not going through all of them because I think we want to leave a little bit more time for, for questions. Um, but again, improve patient outcome in some way or affect patient outcome. Design it so that explainability or we can understand how they work and we'll get back to that. Mitigate bias, validate rigorously, ideally in the workflow, and that's a very important aspect. Maximize traceability of the data and address responsibility in some way. For autonomous AI, that's essentially decided you need to assume liability. And so I may already mentioned tie the AI output to patient outcome. And in this AI, we were actually able to say, well, if you have a positive disease present output of the AI, the risk of getting a poor outcome in one or three years is about tenfold that of if you have a negative output of the AI. And so that's very exciting because rather than comparing it to clinicians, you know, patients don't care whether physicians agree or not on their diagnosis. They want to know, am I getting better? And if not, how can I get better? And so that's ultimately what is more important than physicians agreeing or disagreeing. And so it's really nice if you can tie the AI output, and there's so many examples this morning, uh, to an outcome. A little bit about these reference standards, because again, it's so important that if you validate AI against the right measures. And here I'm trying to show, I came from Amsterdam, as you may hear from my accent, it's not from Iowa. But I came to Iowa and I realized there's actually these clusters of training fellows and residents, training how you train to recognize specific types of disease. I now call that vernacular medicine because it's really very localized and we don't hardly realize that. And so how do you know that one locale, one region has the right answer and another is not, let alone for individual physicians? So that was a problem. And then in addition, if you compare clinicians like me to a reference standard that is based on outcome, Actually, our sensitivity for this disease is quite low, like 40 to 50 percent. Here's two papers that show that. And so that means that actually clinicians at this specific task, very specific level of disease, are not very good. And in the bottom, I tried to show that. But these are all hemorrhages. But about 80 percent on the left is orange pictures. That red dot is a hemorrhage. 80 percent of clinicians agree that the left one is a hemorrhage. And only 20 percent agree that the right one is a hemorrhage. You just see it from, uh, from looking at these Im images. So we created a metric for what the quality of a reference standard is, starting from outcome, which is, you know, like a suicide, mm -hmm. morbid uh, as it is, that is a very strong truth, right? The patient either suicides themselves or not. And then you go from there to proxies, especially for chronic diseases, where it can be a proxy for clinical outcome. And we're used to that in drug studies, like hypercholesterolemia is a, is a proxy for cardiovascular death, maybe. Um, and then there's reference standards like a group of experts, uh, maybe a reading center that has been validated to even lower, just a bunch of uh, clinicians that you ask uh, and maybe you have them vote to even a single clinician and you still see AI papers being validated against a single clinician. Algorithm design is very important. I will skip this slide in the interest of time. But bias is a uh, major subject and when I made these slides, I didn't see that, uh, that there's this entire hour dedicated to so it's very exciting to see. Tomorrow morning we'll be talking more about this. But here's an example of, of uh, AI bias uh, from face recognition that you may be familiar with, where AI was inappropriately trained with an imbalanced uh, training set. But it's more than just a training set, and the same problem we have in the retina, where pigmentation can vary greatly between different races and ethnicities. And if you're not careful, you may train for some ethnicities better than for others. And so you need to avoid that. And one way of avoiding that is actually using biomarker-based approach, where the biomarkers are uh, features that are racially invariant uh, in most cases. This is another uh, interesting thing that, by the way, if you use these biomarker-based approaches, which are based on what we know about the human brain recognizing disease like this, is that you are also more robust. And there's actually a series of papers where you can see on the left, you see an image from a patient and these white dots and there's some red dots mean this patient has the disease. You, you don't need to learn anything else, but believe me that this patient has the disease. The center image, the other orange image with these blood vessels and then these white spots is almost identical. You cannot see the difference, but if you subtract them, you will see about a 1% difference in pixel values. Uh, it was artificially changed with some noise. And it turns out that a single straightforward black box CNN, convolutional neural network, will pick up disease on the left image, but if it was trained even on different training sets, not including this image, it will fail on the right in about 97% of cases. While biomarker-based uh, algorithms, like a clinician, can see these hemorrhages and these exudates as what they are, and therefore 
gra fails gracefully, but doesn't immediately fail and actually still recognizes this as disease. So mitigate bias is actually becoming a really important subject. And the only thing I want to stress here is we're developing this, this approach with FDA, where there's a paper coming out for considerations for AI bias and equity, is that it can affect every phase of the development of an AI from the concept where are you going to use it? What is the price of the AI going to be? If it's very expensive, it will only be used in some locales. And if you're trying to improve access, that is not probably the place where you want to be. So even from the concept of what is the hardware going to be, how are you going to price it, all the way to where you implement it, include, as, as well as, of course, the training set and how you build your AIs can all affect uh, how much AI bias you have. Another argument that uh, it, it's starting to become more, uh, more obvious, but I, I, I like this argument so much, which is that we should validate as much as we can in the workflow in which it will be used. And this very important example is from R2, and you may know from literature, or even from memory, that there was this AI for breast cancer detection approved by FDA based on a study with comparing it to 200 radiologists where it did really well. Um, but that was not how it was being used. It was being used as an assistive AI. Like I said, we were the first autonomous, but this was in the, in the 2000s. It was used in an assistive manner with a radiologist, as well as the AI both looked at the same mammogram, looking for features of breast cancer. And then the AI said, hey, you need to look more carefully at this or that lesion. So that's an assistive mode. That was not how it was validated for FDA approval. Then Fenton et al. in New England Journal of Medicine in 2007, very important publication, decided to actually see whether the outcome for the women uh, diagnosed by an AI with the radiologist was better than that without the AI. And everyone expected it, well, I did, that the AI would improve the radiologist. And it turned out it did not. And this ROC curve shows that, that actually the cat use worsened the outcomes for women. Uh, and, and so th this shows you that you need to validate it in the workflow and not in some you know, magical uh, way that has nothing to do with how it's being used. Another aspect, and that's mostly for the discussion tomorrow of uh, the journal editors, is pre-registration. And, you know, FDA, for FDA approval, it's like the norm. You cannot get past FDA without pre-registration of your study. But it's, it's a really cool uh, um, graph, I think, where you see the two, in 2000, you see this, this, this segue almost where before 2000, lower is uh, more marginal studies. And um, before 2000, when the FDA started requiring pre-registration for drug studies, you see that all sorts of studies showed an effect. And then after 2000, that all went away and almost no studies showed effect. This is just the bias that you have as a scientist of getting your paper published, getting your study published, as well as, of course, the bias from pharma companies trying to get these papers through. Pre-registration is so important, and I think we can do much more. I'm an editor of a journal myself, and so, yeah, we need to do more there. Validation, including bias. So when, uh, definitely the FDA is on board with this. When you validate your AI in these pre-registered studies, you have to address bias, you have to prove, for example, that there is no bias with respect to sensitivity or specificity. And that was part of the trial, was actually, most of the effort of the trial went into showing that there was no racial or ethnic bias, as well as no age bias. I will skip this. Maximize data traceability. I think this will become more important. I, I realize we have HIPAA. I realize in Europe we have GDPR. But if you ask a, a group of, of anyone uh, who owns patient-derived data, and you ask the patients, they will say, yeah, we, I do. Physicians think they do. Payers think they do. Healthcare systems, they do. And even EHR companies think they do. And so this is a conflict waiting to happen. Even though there's HIPAA, that may not always be acceptable. And I like to make the example of Henrietta Lacks, where she was a patient. She had a lymphoma. She ultimately uh, died from the disease. But her, her cells were taken. And for, to make the diagnosis, but it turned out these were immortal cells, and they're still alive. And they're actually still being used to develop new pharma products, do bioscientific research, but that was without her consent or approval, or let alone of that of the family. And ultimately, billions of dollars have been earned based on that cell line. And the family said, well, 
this is part of our estate. We, we won part of that, and they won in lawsuits. So even though at the time, in 1951, the legal situation was not very clear, you can see that societal pressure can change. And now suddenly, people want a part of, of what, what that. Let's say that you make billions of dollars on an AI. Patients may say, well, I helped with the training data. I want part of that. And so right now, we think it's solved, but I think 10 years from now, that may change. And so we, I think we need to get ready for that. Medical liability, uh, we already mentioned it. Um, uh, it's now part, I'm proud to say, of the American Medical Association AI policy that autonomous AI creators, at least, should have some liability for the performance of the AI. And I think that's a very good thing. I've been speaking about that for a long time, that indeed, um, if you are a provider and are using an AI, or you're anyone and you're using an AI, and the AI creator says, well, I don't want to be liable for this, who's going to be? Um, and then we shouldn't use it. Just like if you go to a doctor and they make a medical decision for you, they will, they will be liable for that. The AI creator should be liable. You cannot hold an AI itself. It doesn't have agency, it's, it's a device. So the AI creator is the next big, uh, best party. It's interesting because when we were uh, got FDA uh, approval, uh, insurance companies came to us because they wanted to learn, they wanted to insure us to see how this was going to be litigated. There's still no lawsuit, but it, of course it will come and then we'll see uh, how we deal with that. Did I skip a slide? Okay, so I think that for example resulted in autonomous AI being part of the standard of care in diabetes. So you can now get an AI, an autonomous AI, to make sure that you meet the standard of care. Similarly for payment, so this was a regulatory framework, right, based on an ethical framework. Similarly, we can create a reimbursement framework, and I'm not going to much detail because I want you, know, you to read the paper when it comes out, but it's, it's really about uh, how can you use criteria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is probably the best slide to show about it. How can you use criteria like equity or ethical, ethical principles to come to a value of the AI? Because as an AI creator, you will always have to answer the question, well, what is the value of what, what we created here? And so I tried to explain it to Congress, and, and I think it really helped. But it was, yeah, making the sausage. I mean, you, you do not always want to be there when that happens. So here I am in the US Senate explaining this uh, payment framework. You know, do we base it on the cost of electricity for every inference? Do we base it on the cost of R&D? That's no-no under Medicare. Do we base it on cost, cost effectiveness? That's also a no-no under Medicare. Is there another mechanism? Yes, there is. And we build, essentially base it on access or equity where we said, well, we don't want to pay what currently someone like me is getting, which is $170 from Medicare. Rather, we'll go to $55, which is what we ended up with, because that allows us to do three times as many patients for the same amount of money we're currently paying, which clearly you're willing to pay as a society, right? So nothing is changing, but now you have many, much more access and you remove health disparities at the same cost. So that's one way of saying this is the value of the AI. Cost effectiveness is really hard. In fact, I mentioned $55 for the autonomous AI from Medicare, $170 for me, uh, you know, getting that from Medicare if I build 300. But actually the cost effectiveness threshold is about $600. This is a pretty cost effective diabetic eye exam, meaning you can save cost long term by doing these eye exams. That's by the way why the MIPS and HEDIS quality measures exist. And so, if you price it at $600, you actually drive up the price of healthcare rather than drive down. Well, that's not what I wanted here. Okay, I mentioned, you know, we can now close a care gap with an autonomous AI, which probably is for healthcare systems the most exciting thing about all of this. It's literally in the language. CPT1, uh, category one code was very exciting. And ultimately, this was the big moment, right, where as last year, as of January 1, 2022, you can get a physician fee schedule reimbursement purely for using an autonomous AI at this. Uh, and it was interesting because CMS spent about 20 pages discussing the pros and cons, essentially the ethical guardrails that they want to see around the use of AI. What they were saying very clearly, it was, we're now opening the floodgates for all AI to be reimbursed. No, every time we do this, we want to see very clearly what the guardrails are, back to this ethical framework. I don't think any of this would have happened without this ethical framework. And then commercials typically follow quickly if you, if you do everything else right. So that's, that's good, 95% of them are now reimbursing it. So again, this timeline sort of shows it. All the way on the left, you start with this cool algorithm, right? This 
glamorous uh, AI, then you start, you know, you, you, you develop your, your, your bioethical framework. I'm not saying that every one of you needs to do that. It's already done, right? It's there. You can use other frameworks. You don't need to use ours. But the point is, it is very beneficial to use these frameworks because it's just easier for stakeholders, all stakeholders, to accept it in your work within that framework. Have the approval, liability, and then you know, all, the, all the things that flow after that, standards of care, quality measures, and then ultimately reimbursement. But it all started with, we want to address health disparities, but you can only do that if you have reimbursement, if you're allowed to market it by the FDA. 10 minutes? How is the question going? Some or a lot? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm almost done. I skipped a lot. Uh, so one, was it worth it? In my view, yes. There's some preliminary data here from an Arab one that I have at a, uh, PI at, at Hopkins where we did this randomized clinical trial of pediatric endocrinology diabetes patients, uh, mostly black populations in Baltimore. And we randomized them to either an AI arm or the traditional referral to an ophthalmologist like me. Um, and the preliminary results show that, as usual, about 6% got an eye exam if they were in the traditional arm, and 99%, which is amazing, in the AI arm. So this is all I'm going to share because I, I, I do want to bring the paper out ultimately and not disclose too much. But I think, yeah, you can r remove health disparities in uh, traditionally underserved populations with autonomous AI and AI in general, I think. Here's another one. This was actually an NPR a while ago where we implemented this autonomous AI in a diabetes clinic in downtown New Orleans. Largely black population, but there was hardly any eye care providers left after Katrina that almost disappeared. If, for example, 805 patients had no diabetic eye exam in the past years. We came in nine months post, almost all of them had had a diabetic eye exam thanks to this AI. Um, and here you see on the right uh, this NPR article. I think it's still on there. Well, there's a bunch of others. I think it's, it's more fun to, uh, to go to my closing slide. So, yeah, I did want to bring up the pink sand beaches because, you know, I was sort of brought here for the pink sand beaches in the cocktail. So here's a big sand beach. Uh, and those rose-colored glasses we can now, you know, put aside because, indeed, the future for healthcare AI is bright if we do it right. So we'll close here and uh, look forward to the questions. Uh, those online, uh, watching online, submit your questions online and they'll be read in the room. So go ahead and submit. Uh, great talk. You've been very convincing um, that you're an ethical uh, scientist. What if you were not and you wanted just to enrich the practices of ophthalmologists and you tweaked your algorithm to just generate, let's say, a lot more referrals, led to a lot more uh, diagnostic procedures and things. How would anyone know that you did that? Is there any point in the process where that could be elucidated? Um, or is that going to remain hidden for sort of um, in, in the post market if someone wants to try to examine that and figure that out? Is there anything in the approval process or the evaluation by payers, et cetera, where that could become obvious? Great question. Um, I think there's this big difference between FDA-regulated AI and non-regulated AI, where if you never market it, you can make any AI you want, and you can, if you're a clinician, you can use it on any patient. So that's unregulated. By the way, all the papers about AI bias and the unfortunate side effects from AI are in the unregulated space. They're never marketed, they're built, people use them. Uh, Ken was saying it this morning, right? AI is used everywhere, including for uh, pre-authorization. I think the FDA looks at this very differently. They want you to lock the AI. Right now, there's no continuous learning for FDA. Um, you need to disclose how you build it, how you train it. All these regulatory considerations are in the submission. Uh, and then as well, the validation should make sure that th this does not happen. I agree with you, this unethical people can build these AIs, but to get them past FDA is a whole different ballgame. And then all the other stakeholders have learned what to look for in terms of regulatory approval, clinical trials, et cetera. And there's post-marketing monitoring that you have to disclose. Again, FDA really knows what they're doing there. And you know, I'm proud to say it was not easy. We took eight years to work with FDA 
when I first came in, I said, hey, I want a computer to make a diagnosis. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you know, 80 years later, this is a really strong uh, collaboration. And so I think they know what they're doing, right? But I think the risk is much larger in these unregulated, typical healthcare systems, developed AIs. There's a lot to be done there, I think. Yeah, so we have a question from Peter Solovitz, and that is practical use of tools show that systems that are doing great in academic testing have problems in deployment. So, for example, nurses give poor pictures, indecisive cases take weeks to be resolved, etc. Is this fixable? Um, so, I agree with the first point, which is sort of the Fenton uh, issue, right? But that was even an FDA approved AI where the workflow was just not taken into consideration and then it failed when you actually used it in clinic which, you know, for academic products may be even worse. But the second question didn't seem to align with that. I, I'm not sure I understand the second part. So I think the, pro the, the question that we're looking for is basically this gap between the academic process of implementing and testing in a controlled setting academically versus what happens when we actually go into a health system and can we fix that using AI? Well, we go back to the silo picture, right? I mean, if, if, if you're in the silo, try to open yourself up and break out and at least interact with all the stakeholders. And then, you know, maybe even try to think about an ethical framework and see how you can answer to that. But th there's ways to get out of that. Thank you. All right. Uh, fabulous talk. It took 12 years, 2008 to 2022, no, more than that. Uh, 10 and 14, yeah, 14 years, roughly. Um, if you were to do it again, <laughs> if somebody else were to do it, what advice would you have for them to minimize that interval? Because the opportunity cost for waiting 14 years to get the 3x productivity gain that you just demonstrated is too high. So how do we shorten that? I, I, it, you know, I said, I, I would do it again. I mean, I, I needed to do it, and I would have done it. It cost me my hair color, and, you know, it's, anyway. It, 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 um, it was tough, but I think now that you have done the first one, it's much easier. And you see that they're already approving other autonomous AI products. So I think it's changed, changed in a major way. I mean, Suchi was saying this morning that now is the time. I wish it was I had been 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and it wasn't, and so that's okay. But now it's way easier. We have these ethical frameworks. We have these regulatory frameworks. We, we know exactly what to do, how to do, get a CPT code. I can tell you how to get into a standard of care. I can tell you how to get HEDIS and MIPS to accept your AI, provided you meet certain requirements, um, to close a care gap. I can tell you how CMS will look at you when you want to get reimbursement for your autonomous AI. So. I think the, the, the recipes, the prescriptions are there. You just need to execute on them. And that's very different because we really had to invent a the wheel. There was nothing. Every, every time I ran into a rule or regulation, it was always saying some human needs to do this in some magic way. So I think it's much, much, much easier. Thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about the current state of the data arms race. So what I mean by that is uh, maybe five, seven years ago, some of those earliest images were you know, the retinal fundus images from the Arvind Thai Institute. And then you'd call Nikon and GE and others and try to gather enough data to make these algorithms usable. And to follow up on Nigam's question, to shorten the timeline and make the algorithms real, you have to find an epidemiologically representative sample of data, people have to share, and then patients have to be okay with sharing. How do we reconcile that now, where we need to get access to better quality data, and it's someone in the private sector, it's someone in the hands of patients, and then there's the research community in the private sector? Yeah, there's, there's land grab for, for data, like you rightfully point out, and it's harder for, for startups, and you need to be well-funded, angel-funded, to, to get your hands on the data. Healthcare system, when I started, I created a telemedicine project just to get the training data, right, this 20 years ago. And so that's, that's harder and harder. So you need good collaborations. Um, I think data sharing arrangements can be, can be improved. There's a lot of pressure from NIH now, NEI, to at least allow uh, uh, data collected with grants from, from NIH to, to be used for developing AI in a more easy fashion. I mean, there's actually a you know, work group on that. So I think as we, you know, the dust settles, I think this will be better. But right now it's indeed a land grab, yeah. 
I wonder if you'd speak a little bit more about the differences in the liability models for uh, physician-provided care versus autonomous AI. In, in physician-provided care, we have a, not just uh, being wrong, but being right, wrong outside the, the bounds of the standard of care, which involves human fallibility. Do we, do we have a model for what being wrong for an autonomous AI looks like, and, and how are companies thinking about this as they develop products? I can only speak for my company, and I can only speak for how I see it, because nothing has been litigated, right? And so it will have to be litigated, and then we'll find out. My, my stance is, you know, having been involved, not for myself, but in, in, as an expert for medical malpractice claims, you see that if there is a, a standard and you follow the standard, if something goes wrong, you know, it's hard to, to, to prosecute. However, if you clearly flaunt the standards, then, uh, or you, you keep repeating uh, similar mistakes, there's a pattern of misbehavior, you know, that leads to convictions or settlement, bad settlements. And so I think it's similar for AI. If in this, what we say contractually, it's contractually right now, there's no, as there is no litigation or jurisprudence. We say that if the performance of the AI is below a certain norm, then we are liable. If the, if the performance of the AI is, is within range that we promise, right, uh, marketing claims, then uh, uh, we do not accept uh, liability. So it's, it's a limited liability similar to a physician. But you do, a physician doesn't state that the right is sort of jurisprudence now. Does that say that you have an ongoing process of testing the AI to build the Correct. But that's, by the way, re, con, continuous efficacy monitoring is sort of required now by FDA. So post-market, there needs to be a system, which is an interesting discussion, because as I, sh I hope I showed, we proved it against a proxy for outcome. And so some people say, well, continuous learning should be where I have an AI, it's locked, uh, and now I see that the physician disagrees with the output of the AI. Oh, the AI must be wrong. Let me retrain the AI with this new, you know, small data point. But I already tried to show that physicians in many cases are more wrong than right, so you make, actually make, make it worse. And so that's a problem for this continuous efficacy monitoring. As you improve access, you want to drive down the cost by using the AI, $55. To, to get at this truth, it's about $2,000 per patient. So now, to do the, do the really well continuous efficacy monitoring, you would need to drive up the pace for every place where you do it. That's an unsolved problem right now. We need to solve it. But at least for now, we're definitely monitoring uh, a, a percentage of all uh, diagnoses. Long answer to short question, sorry. All right, that's going to be our last question. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. for this super thought-provoking talk. That was awesome. I'd just like to take a moment uh, to thank our sponsors. Sale 2022 would not be possible without the support of United Health Group, Apple, New England Journal of Medicine, Metadata, and Verily. So thank you so much for our sponsors for really making it possible for us to be here. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next invited talk towards trustworthy ML.